welcome to TAC Talks. My name is Mel Hartley from the Training Accreditation Council, or TAC. And before we start, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are recording on, the Wajak people. We wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. Today's episode is part of a series where we amplify excellence in WA VET through award winner stories. Today I'm talking to Holly Goodsell, winner of the WA and Australian Vet Teacher Trainer of the Year Awards. Holly is an advocate for Aboriginal education and a champion of student success. Holly has worked overseas teaching English in Kenya and China, then returned to Australia to continue her teaching career at Fitzroy Crossing. After moving into TAFE, Holly was approached to develop and deliver a new program for the Department of Education to upskill Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander education officers across Perth metropolitan schools. Congratulations on your incredible win as the WA and Australian Vet Teacher Trainer of the Year. It's so great to have you here, especially because TAC is a proud sponsor of the WA Trainer of the Year Award. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. First, I'd just like to ask you about teaching in Kenya and China and also in Fitzroy Crossing. Could you tell us a little bit more about those experiences? Yeah, absolutely. So I got my primary school teaching degree straight out of, you know, high school, as everyone does, you know, straight into university. And I thought that I wanted to be working in an early childhood environment in a primary school here in Perth. Um, I did that for a short amount of time before I realised that it something was missing. Um, I knew that I had this strong urge to want to help people and it wasn't quite filling fulfilling that need, I suppose. So I decided to go travelling and that totally changed my path. Um, I decided to come back to Perth and um, complete my teaching English to speakers of other languages qualification at university. And that quickly took me on a different path. I was off to Kenya and I taught in Mombasa and I really got the the bug for working with students with diverse learning needs and making learning fun. That was what I really thrived off of. And so I came back to Perth. I was home for about less than two weeks and I thought I'm just going to keep going. So I went to China and I, again, got that bug that I was like, I have to keep going. So it was funny how life happens, you know, because I feel that when when it's right, things happen very easily. So when I came back to Australia after my stint in China, I put it out there that um, to a couple of girlfriends saying, I really want to go teach in a remote community. Within five days, I was in Fitzroy Crossing, so <laughs> I really wow. didn't stop for, <laughs> for some time. Um, and then I was there just under two years, and that's when I really fell in love with working with students with diverse learning needs and particularly working with students um, with trauma and incorporating those trauma-informed practices into my teaching. I learned a lot about the culture, but I fell in love with the culture and working with um, Aboriginal people. And so I was so fortunate when I came back to Perth to be given an opportunity to develop such a course at North Metropolitan TAFE um, after teaching and education support for some time. So it was all meant to be. That sounds so awesome. And what and what a whirlwind of different things that you did. Absolute so whirlwind. Great. I just want to focus on your working in the remote community. It seems to have had a really profound impact on your approach to Aboriginal education. Was there a particular experience, student, cultural event that ignited your passion in this area? I have to say it was it's probably not what you would expect, but it's something that still stays with me to this day. Um, I worked really hard with my students um, in terms of like trauma-informed care and creating a safe space for my students. So that became my priority even now with my adult students that I work with. So every single morning I created um, this social-emotional time in the morning where I would check in with each of my students. We would 
talk about strategies to deal with um, students that perhaps weren't coping in their home environments and how we can support them. And I started creating this really safe place in my classroom. And because of that, I saw the effects that in, we were in a district high school and for some time my class had the highest attendance and I was thinking like why is that and I think it really does come down to the fact that I put a lot of time and effort into creating that safe space for my students to come so I learned a lot about you know like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and meeting those physiological needs of students in the classroom so if students are coming in and they're not, they haven't been fed, they haven't been, um, you know, looked after, they haven't showered, any of those things, then that, that's my number one priority before they're able to learn that day, right? And and to maybe work with them to solve any of their social, emotional distress that they may be feeling at that time. So I started incorporating a lot of strategies and I think that that has helped me a huge amount with the students that I'm working with now. I'm not just lecturing. I feel like sometimes I am also supporting emotionally and not counselling. That's a little bit too far. But, you know, I'm that safe. I try to be that safe space for my students and lend an ear and a shoulder if I have to. And then everything else happens after that. So that's like step number one is create a safe space for my students. That's like my passion. And I think that's why I was selected to create this program at North Metro TAFE later on. <laughs> that just sounds absolutely amazing. And uh, you've mentioned a couple of times uh, this course at North Metro TAFE. Is this the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Officer Program? Yep, Education Officer Program, yes. Awesome. Uh, would you just be able to explain what that program is and how it shaped your approach to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2021, the Department of Education approached North Metropolitan Tape to create a course specifically for Aboriginal and Islander education officers. At the time, we were obviously um, servicing education uh, assistants in schools. And so what we knew that we could do, because the role of the education assistant and the role of the Aboriginal Islander education officer, they do in some ways overlap. But obviously, the AIO role is more about creating um, the cultural safety for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and supporting community supporting families in school. So that was that added element. So I knew that I couldn't do that alone, being a non-Indigenous person, and I wanted to make sure that I was providing cultural safety to my adult students. So we did bring on an AIO who lectured alongside me that year and helped me to create the course outline and to create the course. So basically what we did was take the education assistant course, we took out some of those elective units and we put in more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander education specific units so that it would um, closely relate to the job description form of an AIO versus an education assistant. So you helped develop that AIO course, is that Correct. right? Yes. Yes. So is it online? Is it face-to-face? -face? How do you deliver it? Yeah, absolutely. So we knew in the developing phase, which I absolutely loved, by the way, because I love organising things. So when we're in the development phase of like, okay, how is this course going to not only run, but how is it going to be successful and how are we going to maintain engagement? Because that's our number one goal. So we thought, right, we need to look at three different things. And this is sort of our guiding pedagogy along the way, and particularly in the development phase, is we were looking at the um, eight Aboriginal ways of learning. So that's a really fantastic culturally responsive um, program that includes um, cultural perspectives and knowledge. And it basically outlines how best Aboriginal people learn. So, of course, we were going to use that pedagogy when we were planning. So this, it had already outlined for us that we need to include story sharing, we need to include community links, how are we going to include nonverbal, verbal, 
those sorts of things. The other part was the UDL principles, so the Universal Design for Learning. So multiple means of engagement, um, multiple means of representation and multiple means of action and expression. So it's basically like how can we eliminate as many barriers as possible and give the students as many different ways to complete assignments, to engage with the learning materials, to um, present their information. So, and of course, those trauma-informed care principles as well. So we took all three of those and we designed this course. It was, it was a one-year work-based training course, which meant that we would go to them. So I would go out to the schools and work with the students in school and the schools would support us and give additional time to the students to work with us. Um, and it was on-site training. And that was really successful, and it still is. We're in our third year, fourth year of the course now, and we're still going. And so that hasn't changed. Um, and so, yeah, it was a work-based model. Students could access Blackboard or learning, you know, materials online, and then they would complete their assessments in multiple different ways depending on their learning styles. So we thought um, we would allow the students, if they wanted to, printing off assessments, completing them handwritten. They could type up their assessments or we um, created a type of assessment called assessment yarning. And that strong, strongly links to the eight ways of learning, um, you know, pedagogy around story sharing. So we wanted students to be able to complete their assessments um, by just having an informal yarn, telling us what do they already know you know, what we want them to learn and then gap train from there. So it was like a very empowering, it's, yeah, it's very empowering for the students that we are recognising that they're coming in with a wealth of knowledge and we want to recognise that. Um, and, and a lot of students opted to do assessment yarning as a form of assessment. So that was, that has been, yeah, one of the most oh, important great. parts of our course, which is great, yes. That is so fantastic and it's actually like really topical because the current uh, standards for RTOs are being uh, reviewed to include more on this uh, wellbeing support services, inclusive training environments and the cultural safety of uh, First Nations staff and learners. So it sounds like what you're doing is right along that track. Could you explain a little bit more about the eight ways of learning that, that you were talking about? Absolutely. So we um, we took the eight ways of learning. So there are, if you um, wouldn't mind, I'll just tell you what the eight ways are and then Please. perhaps yeah. tell you how we incorporated them into our course. So there's story sharing. So that's all about that yarning element and it's such an important cultural element in Aboriginal culture. So we wanted to think, right, how can we incorporate story sharing? So that can be from, you know, recognising that prior experience, having that yarn with them, what do they already know, and then scaffolding from there, absolutely. Um, another part of that is assessment yarning as well. Um, I also meet with students over teams and can complete their assignments orally uh, that way. So there's multiple means as, you know, those UDL principles, multiple means of um, representation in terms of their knowledge. Um, community links. So we incorporated like networking hubs, networking events so that they could learn from each other and grow and learn in a group, in a safe space of other Aboriginal learners. So once a term, we try to get students together for a networking event. Um, I also create a monthly newsletter, which showcases good work that's happening out there and, and professional development opportunities for students as well. So that has been really well received and students really love sending me their, you know, good news stories and what they're doing in schools. Some of them, you know, um, their student population at their school has increased since they've done this and then they share that with other students and they're, oh, I want to do that too. And so it's been a really great sharing opportunity. Um, deconstruct, reconstruct, so pulling things apart and then putting them back together. So it might be something as simple as breaking down a task into smaller chunks. 
um, I do, we do, you do. So modeling to the students what you want them to see, making it very visual. So that's how I've also incorporated that. Um, non-linear so um, you know that there's multiple ways of getting to a solution it's like you know in, in any maths problems everyone's going to get to that solution in very different ways so allowing the student different ways to reach the you know same sort of outcome land links so a lot of our um, contextualization of the course, of course, is Noongarks. We're on Noongar Wadjuk land. So if we're getting any professional development opportunities come through or contextualizing any of our health materials or anything for any of our units, we make sure it's relevant to what's happening here in Perth. So Noongar Wadjuk land. Um, symbols and images. So making things visual, um, having a very clear, even with say like, um, my visit schedules and things, I make sure they're colourful, they're bright, very clear sort of outline, timetables, um, everything is given in like visual hard copy forms. And then the last two are non-verbal, so including some opportunities for students to demonstrate their opportunity through non-verbal means. We're not able to obviously hit all of these eight ways, but um, we're still working on with this some that we do better than others. Um, but of course, you know, at least we know what they are and we're trying to always incorporate them. And then learning maps. So again, there's those visit schedules, things like that. So off the back of this, we created the three C's, which is a great framework for any RTO that they can use when they're supporting Aboriginal education. And that is cultural safety, contextualization and communication. So if they can think about those three things when they're developing an Aboriginal program, I think that that will really help them in that planning phase and then also with maintaining engagement um, and motivation throughout the course. So I can talk to those three C's if you wanted to. Oh, yes, that would be fantastic. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> okay, so um, communication before even um, in the first early weeks of the course, we sent out a Microsoft form to all of our students. And on that form, we asked things like obviously contact details, but what would be the best form of communication for you? So would you like us to text, call, email? What's your preferred form of communication? A lot of students opted for texting over calling or emails, a much more informal way of, you know, getting in touch with my students. Um, on there, we also asked if there was any cultural responsibilities, familial responsibilities that we needed to know about that may impact on their learning. And also if they were comfortable, if our AIO support staff was not available, would they be comfortable meeting with me alone? Um, and it was, if they weren't comfortable, then we would make sure that we had an Aboriginal staff member with us when we went out into school. So that just provided that additional cultural safety. Um, we made, yeah, very flexible contact. So we would go out to schools three to four times a term and that face-to-face -face interaction made students accountable. We had really good relationships with the line managers at the school, so that also was another form of accountability for keeping up with their studies. Um, in terms of communication as well, we had networking hubs um, and networking events at Coolark, which is our centre for Aboriginal students, and they would often go there to um, do additional study or receive any of that cultural support that sometimes I'm not able to give. Um, and, of course, those newsletters, which I talked about before. So those are some of the ways that we, you know, make sure that we are hitting that communication. Cultural safety, um, yeah, we had an Aboriginal mentor. We use Coolark. We obviously, with this as well, with trauma-informed care, is, is providing that um, social-emotional support first and relationship building. So a lot of the time I go out to schools for the first half an hour, sometimes we're just catching up, you know, and talking about their families, we're talking about things that are happening in their lives, and I'm just a, a listening ear. I'm not expecting to go there and get straight into study, you know. I'm Relationship building is number one, and then the learning comes after that. Um, and I think that's really helped in maintaining student engagement as well throughout. 
And then the very last thing we did was contextualizing all of our learning materials. So we got appropriate pictures, visuals. Um, we use Aboriginal led websites, um, all of our, you know, making sure that we're using culturally appropriate resources. So we had to do a lot of like an overhaul of all of our learning materials to make sure that it was meeting the needs of our students and it was appropriate. You guys have done so much. And I really like the three C's concept. That is such a great concept that you've got there. To really finish off today, is there anything that you would like to tell RTOs about incorporating cultural safety or is there anything that will help them on this journey with student diversity and, and how to do this better? Yeah, absolutely. So if I could direct them, you know, as a starting point to even going on to the eight ways of learning, looking into those UDL principles and those trauma-informed practices and thinking, right, how can we meet each of these, you know, markers, I suppose, when we you are wanting to develop an Aboriginal program? I think number one, relationship building and creating a safe space for your student. Those things are paramount. If your student doesn't feel safe with you, that they can have an informal yarn, they can learn about you, you can learn about them, and then they can be a safe place, um, you can be a safe place for them, then the learning won't happen. So that can be, you know, if there's one takeaway, I hope from this is that we're providing those trauma-informed care principles with our students. Um, and then, of course, from there, the three Cs, just follow that three C, um, I suppose it's a really great framework. So contextualise, provide cultural safety and provide multiple means of communication, then the rest will hopefully all unfold. <laughs> So where can we find the Eight Ways of Learning? Is it a website or? Yeah, yeah. so it's Eight Ways Online and um, yeah, it was developed in consultation with James Cook University and with the Department of Education. Um, and so it had, a, you know, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander input into this pedagogy and this is what they've come up with saying this is the best way to teach Aboriginal students. So that should be the starting point. Then, of course, incorporate those UDL and incorporate those trauma informed, and then that's a great starting point. No problem. We'll stick the link into the notes so everyone can find them. Sure. Thank you so much for speaking to me today, Holly. Your dedication and innovative approach to supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander learners is really, truly inspiring. And I really do appreciate you sharing your insights and passions with us today. And that brings us to the end of this very special episode. And you've been listening to TAC Talks with your host, Mel Hartley, and award winner, Holly Goodsell. Mm -hmm.